Okay, hi everybody, shalom. Uh, once again, uh, we're giving our uh, shear from a different location. Uh, this happens to be the conference room of uh, Yeshiva Tor Sameach, uh, where uh, I teach when I'm not at Jibana. This is where I usually am. And uh, once again, I'm very, very happy to have everyone that's uh, listening uh, to the shear. Uh, today's shear is dedicated for a refuah shlema for all those who are recently affected by the war and a special prayer for success in the release of the hostages. I think all of us will answer amen to that bracha. <coughs> and aliyat neshama for all those who were recently murdered or died defending the Jewish nation. Uh, in addition, we have a dedication in honor of Rabbi Breidowitz by Mark and Julia Weintraub in Vancouver and Abby and Ellie Delawa in Muncie. Thank you very much. And an anonymous dedication for the Hatzlacha Rabbah and Hashem's protection of all of our Chayalim that they, sh they should return healthy to their homes with Briyutz and Nitzachon. May Hashem bring the Geula now. Again, all of us can answer Amen. Uh, this is a, a difficult time in Eretz Israel, and of course uh, Jews all over the world are connected to us here in Eretz Israel. Uh, the uh, campaign in Gaza is proceeding apace. Uh, the uh, ground invasion is going to be imminent. And unfortunately, B'derech HaTeva, that's going to initiate a new level of danger uh, for the Chayalim, for the hostages, and perhaps for the rest of the country as well. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we are strong. And Baruch Hashem, even in these tragedies, there are silver linings. And I just want to share with you that I spoke to a woman who wanted to do something for the army. And she spoke to the organizations and she said, what can we send the Chayolim? Uh, should we send them clothing or medicine or books or food, whatever? And uh, she was told that the biggest thing, the biggest demand of the Chayolim is they want tzitzis. And this is not only coming from religious. The religious soldiers already have tzitzis. This is coming from non-religious Chayolim. And tens of thousands, people who may not even be keeping Shabbos yet, want to wear the tzitzis. They want to have this tangible connection to God. And we know that, of course, Israeli society is very, very highly polarized. And before this war, there was so much, so much dissension about so many issues that I think we've seen now are relatively unimportant in perspective. And as is often the case, very sadly, it is through the crucible of tragedies and difficulties that we discover that there's much more that unites us than separates us. And if this can be a catalyst for Avat Yisrael, for Achdus, for unity, for togetherness, then that would be a tremendous bracha. God willing, we should have peace very, very, very soon. But the one thing, the one nightmare that I have about the peace is that maybe we'll forget a lot of the togetherness and solidarity that we formed during the war. So my prayer is that although the negative effects of the war should vanish and our soldiers and our captives should return to their homes in the fullness of body and spirit and the Jewish people should not suffer in any way. But the one part of the war that I want to continue is the sense of unity, the sense of togetherness, the sense that we're all in this together that right now is a very, very strong feeling among the Jewish people. I hope and I pray that it will continue and that it will endure. And again, can you hear what's on? Uh, last week, I'm not gonna repeat my share of last week, but uh, again, there are many, many indicators that this is connected to the messianic process. This is what is called the Chavlei Mashiach, the birth pangs of Mashiach just as a woman goes into painful labor and contractions before she gives birth, so too before the messianic era unfolds. There will be many cataclysmic, difficult experiences, but it is the labor pain before the birth. 
it is the darkness before the dawn. So if we're going through the darkness and we're going through the pain, we need to know that there is something good at the end of this process. There is something wonderful at the end of this process. There is Geula, there is Mashiach, there is redemption. May we merit to experience that. Bimhei Ravi Amenu. This week's Parsha, of course, we do read also about a cataclysmic event, a liter quite literally an earth-shattering event, where indeed uh, the entire world essentially gets destroyed because of the evil of the generation, right? God made uh, Adam and Eve, God made the world in six days. On day six, he created Adam and Chava. He put them in the Garden of Eden. There was the sin of the tree of knowledge, which resulted in their expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And then there was the murder of Cain and Hevel. And as the saying goes, things have been downhill ever since. And as a result of kind of that very inauspicious beginning, the world degenerates more and more and more and more until it reaches a level of such immorality, such violence, and by the way, the word Hamas, although it's, it's not necessarily an intentional pun, but when it describes the evil of the generation of the flood, it says Hamas, Malaha Aretz Hamas, the world was filled with Hamas, which means violent theft and the like. And God finally decides he must destroy this world. He must delete. He must press the reset button and start over again. And all of humanity, other than Noah and his family, is wiped out. All of the animals are wiped out except for those that were salvaged in the Teva. And the whole world, according to our tradition, is populated from Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, Yafes. Now this does raise some interesting questions which I'm not going to discuss. There are certain chronological timelines that indicate that there were civilizations that are older than the flood that continued like parts of ancient Egypt and you know these are difficulties. Um, it is also a point of discussion was the flood a worldwide event or was it a localized event? Could there have been pockets of humanity that are not descended from Noah that perhaps survived the flood? These are very, very interesting questions and one could uh, perhaps write a book on them. Um, I will say, although I may get in big, big, big trouble on these matters, that my own position is that these are not automatically articles of faith. I believe that within the Jewish tradition, it is possible to find sources that talk about a localized flood, and it may even be possible to identify human beings who may have survived the flood, who were not descended from Noah. Chazal already talk about Og, Melech Abashan, as being someone who survived the flood. <coughs> Excuse me. So, there are you know, different interpretive possibilities that the Torah is not 100% clear about. And as I say, perhaps we will leave this for another time. But nevertheless, the basic description of the Torah is Hishchis kol basar, everything got corrupt. Rashi points out it's not, that, it's not just the human beings that got corrupt, but even the animals corrupted their ways. Uh, animals were cohabiting with different species. And the Beis Halevi explains that the concept is that the sins of man pollute, quite literally, the environment of the universe. Meaning to say, animals are not balei b'chira. Animals don't have free will. Animals have instincts, and animals generally do not deviate from the way they're programmed. An animal is programmed a certain way, an animal behaves a certain way, an animal will not make decisions beyond the parameters of its instinct. So a herbivorous animal that lives on plants and vegetation is not going to start killing other animals. And yet we find that even the animals were corrupted even though this was obviously not a matter of conscious choice. And the commentaries explain that once human beings corrupt the moral fiber of the universe, everything falls apart, even the physical structures of reality. 
the non-voluntary, non-volitional parts of the world get affected. We have to recognize the power of our deeds. You know, when we commit deeds in violation of God's will, we're not just affecting ourselves, we're affecting our people, we're affecting our nation, we're affecting humanity, we are affecting even the non-human part of the world. And if that's true for the negatives, then how much more so will it be true for the positives? Was it the famous breast of her saying, that which you're capable of destroying, you're capable of repairing. If you can destroy it, you can repair it. The Mabo teaches us we have the capacity to destroy the world. But then we deduce we also have the capacity to repair the world. And if we have that capacity, we have the responsibility. Now let's go back to the very beginning of the Parsha when the Torah introduces us to Noach. The truth is Noach was actually introduced at the end of Parshat Bereshit, very briefly, but he is described in any detail at the beginning of the Parsha. Ela told us Noach, the following is the story of Noach. Noach is tzaddik. Noach is a, or was a righteous man. Tamim haya bidohosav, he was perfect in his generations. Esa Elohim hisalech Noach. Noach walked, again we'll have to explain the expression, Noach walked with God. So you'll notice that Noach is given two positive descriptions. He is described as Sadiq, a righteous person. He is described as Tamim, a perfect person, a complete person. Sadiq, Tamim, and then it mentions Bidorotav, in his generations. Now note the plural. Why does it say he was tzaddik in his generations? Normally a person lives in one generation. Right? So we have two questions here that I want to go over. Question one, what is the significance of Noach being called a tzaddik? and being called a tamim. What's the difference between righteous and perfect? What's the connotation of the difference? That's question one. Question two, what is the meaning of dorosav, his generations? Now, a third observation I want to make is something that Rashi points out. Noah is described in the beginning of the Parsha as a tzaddik and a tamim. When God tells him to go into the Teva, God tells him, go into the Teva, ki o, the, the, the Ark, ki raisi tzaddik uh, it is only you that I see as a tzaddik in this generation. So you'll notice that although Noah is given the praise of a tzaddik and a tamim, when God speaks to him directly, God only calls him a tzaddik, that God does not call him a tamim. Why does God leave out one of the two titles that Noah has. So Rashi gives an answer on that one. Rashi says, from here we learn out that when you praise a person to his face, you only say part of his praises and not all of his praises. So yeah, Noah is tzaddik tamim, but when you're talking to Noah, you don't want him to have a swelled head, so you just say tzaddik. This is the famous rule, mikzat shavacho, <coughs> excuse me, the fun of that you praise a person in his face, to his face only partially. But as we go through this, we're going to see another, another answer. So the two questions we have is, what is the meaning of tzaddik versus the meaning of tamim? And number two, what is the plural of dorosav? So the Meshech Chochma offers the following explanation. The word tzaddik refers primarily to the relationship of man and God. That I keep the laws of God, I serve God properly. I don't violate God's commandments. We would call this a zihirut, a person is careful. In the mitzvot, bein adam, 
la makom, in the commandments between man and God. Tamim refers primarily to your interpersonal behavior of bein adam lechaveiro, man and man. So consequently, Noah is called a tzaddik tamim because he was great in both bein adam la makom and bein adam lechaveiro. That's why it uses the phrase tzaddik tamim. But now let's go a little deeper into the issue of Noah was perfect in his generations. There's a famous Rashi where Rashi brings a debate, really it's both in the Gemara and in the Medrash, although in different versions. What does the Torah mean to say when it says Noah was righteous or Noah was perfect in his generations? So Rashi says, Yesh Dorshin Lishvach. Some people interpret this to Noah's credit. If Noah could be righteous in a world that was totally evil, how much more so he would have been righteous in a world where there were other righteous people like Abraham. In other words, the Torah is highlighting Noah was righteous even in a corrupt generation, how much more so would he have been righteous in a more righteous generation? This is called darshaning l'shvach. We interpret it to his credit. There is another opinion, some people look at things in the negative, that the Torah is being critical of Noah. Noah was righteous compared to everybody else in his generation. But had he been in the generation of Avraham, lo haya nechshav lechlum, he would have been nothing as compared to Avraham, right? So we have a machlokas, right? You see the machlokas here. Do I darshin ledochotav as a praise of Noach? Or do I darshin ledochotav as a denigration of Noach? Now, a little side point here. The Lavush of Mordechai Yaffe, who lived in the 1500s, and he actually wrote a, a commentary on Rashi, actually explains that there's really no machlokas here. Both ma opinions are expressing different sides of the coin. And, and to illustrate the Lavush's point, I'm going to use numbers, which are really meaningless, but they're just for illustrative purposes. Everybody admits that in a generation of evildoers, Noah was only a five, as opposed to Avram, who was, let's say, a, a 10. So the first opinion says, Noah is a five. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the first opinion, uh, well, let me start with the second opinion. The second opinion says, oh, Noah is a five, and he's only righteous by virtue of comparison with people in his generation. Had I taken that five and I put it in Avram's generation, he would have been deficient. The other man, the Omar, admits that Noah was only a five and Avram was a ten. But if Noah would have been in a better generation, he would have been different. He would have been a ten. In other words, according to the Lavush, both opinions say if you look at Noah as he was, he was inferior to Avram. And if you looked at Noah as he would have been, he would have been equal to Avram. So the machlokas is simply, are you looking at him the way he actually was? Or are you looking at him the way he would have become? So the yesh dorshin l'shvach is not saying that the way he was, he was as righteous as Avram. But it's simply saying he would have been more righteous and equal to Avram. The other opinion says that may be true. That the Bush actually says that may be true, but the issue is going to be the way he was, he was affected by his environment. And therefore he was only a five as opposed to Avram that was a ten. So essentially what Rav Mordechai Yafi is doing is he's saying that what appears to be a machlokas. They're both saying the same thing. 
he was a 5 compared to a 10, but he would have been a 10 had he been in that other generation. Ben kach ben kach. Whether we understand this as a real machlokas or just a question of perspective, it's important to note that the comparisons that we are drawing are not between Noach and righteous people in general, but we're specifically highlighting the difference between Noach and Avram. That Noach, according to uh, the negative opinion, had a certain inferior aspect as compared to Avram. So, in what way is Noach and Avram different? So the Zohar HaKadosh has a very, very interesting statement. The Zohar HaKadosh says, come and see the difference between Avram and Noach. When Avram is told by God that the city of Sodom is going to be destroyed and the city of Sodom were evildoers in all ways. Avraham not only prays for Sodom, but Avraham argues with God. Avraham says, how can you destroy all of these cities? What if there are 40 tzaddikim and there weren't? What if there are 35 and there weren't? 30, 20, he goes down to 10. He prays and he bargains and he cajoles and he argues for the benefit of people that most of us would have regarded as degenerate evildoers who are not worthy of God's mercy. Indeed, it's very instructive and a bit problematical that when God tells Avraham later to slaughter, bring his own son Yitzchak as a korban, Avraham doesn't argue. He accepts it without any argument at all. When it comes to Sodom, he argues and he prays. In fact, that, that itself is a very interesting question. That if Avram prays that God should spare even the evildoers, why doesn't Avram argue with Hashem on the Akedah? Again, this is not our partial this week, but I'll just suggest a quick answer to that issue. And that is, there's a difference between God giving you a direct order and God informing you about the news. When God gives you an order, the Avrahams of the world don't question it, even if they don't understand it. God told Avraham, take your son Yitzchak and bring him as an offering. I am commanding you to do it. Now granted, God gave himself a way out. God says later, I didn't say slaughter him, I just said take him up as a korban. But Avram didn't know that. Now Avram is told to do something. He doesn't have the right to argue, to question. So when it comes to obedience to a direct order, Avram says nothing. With the case of Sodom, God did not command Avram. God is simply informing Avram of what he's planning to do. Indeed, on some level, you could even make the argument that God is informing Avram because he's inviting Avram to pray and seek mercy. Right? That would be the chiluk, that would be the difference between the Akedah and Sodom. Nevertheless, when it comes to Sodom, Avram prays and prays and argues and bargains. When Noah, this is back to the Zohar, when Noah is told, I am going to destroy the entire world, Noah builds an ark for 120 years, but Noah utters not a single word of prayer for the generation that is about to be wiped out. So the Zohar says, the difference between Avram and Noah is Avram was concerned not only for himself and his family. Avram was concerned for all of humanity, worthy and unworthy. And Avram sought mercy and compassion and bracha on everybody. Noah 
primarily was concerned with building an ark. Now granted, the fact that it took 120 years was designed so that people would see it and people would ask questions and then he would explain to them that God is going to destroy the world. So there was a certain element of outreach, but it was kind of the outreach of passive outreach. If somebody comes to me, I will explain to them what the situation is. But Noah did not take initiative. Uh, in Yiddish there's an expression of a tzaddik mit a pelts. That means a tzaddik who wears a fur coat. The analogy would be, let's imagine that uh, I'm in a room that's extremely cold. So there are two ways, and, and it's unbearable. There are two ways I could fix the situation. One is I put on a coat. The other is I turn on the heat. The difference between putting on a coat and turning on the heat is when you turn on a co when you put on a coat, you're only helping yourself and you're leaving everybody else in the cold. When you turn on the heat, you're benefiting everybody. So in Yiddish there's an expression when the tzaddik is concerned primarily for himself, he's a tzaddik mitapelt, he's a tzaddik who is wearing a fur coat. The Zayar Akadash says that Nayach was a tzaddik mitapelt. Avram Avinu cared about others. And that was the merit of Avram versus Noah. The Zohar goes on and says that that is why the flood is referred to in the book of Isaiah, Sefer Yeshayo, as May Noah, the flood of Noah. Why is it called the flood of Noah? Because Noah is responsible. Perhaps with his tefillos, his care, his compassion, his turning to God, seeking mercy for the other people in the world. Perhaps the flood could have been averted. And therefore, if there's any negative comparison to Noah and Sadiqim, it is not a negative comparison of Sadiqim in general, but it's specifically a negative comparison to the Mida of Avram Avinu. Caring about others, praying for others, being concerned for their welfare. Rev. Dessler explains that this is actually why Noah had to be in the ark for an entire year. If you go through the chronology of the Chumash, there's a machlok is exactly when the flood started. Did it start in Cheshvan? Or did it start in Eeyore, depending on whether you're looking at Nisan or Tishrei as the first month. But whatever your chronology is, it was 365 days, a solar year, that Noah spent on the ark. Noah was in the ark with his family 365 days. There were four, again, there were 40 days of rain, and then there was 150 days where the water remained at the highest level. And then there was gradual receding. And Noah, and Noah sent out the birds, etc. But Noah did not leave the Teva and step on dry land until 365 days from the day he alighted into that Teva. Now the question is, why did Noah need such a long time on the ark? You know, God could have destroyed the world in one second. God could have made an atom bomb. You know, God could just destroy everything and clear out the radiation and take Noah out. Noah could have been, could have been I mean, first he didn't even need a teva. Noah could have been in and out in a day. Why was he there a year? So Rav Dester explained that Noah was there for the entire year to build a certain element of his character that had been lacking. The Gemara in Sanhedrin says many, many years later, Eliezer, the faithful servant of Avram, interviewed the much older Shem, the surviving son of Noah. Noah is long dead. 
But shame lived for many years afterwards. And shame, we know actually, was a righteous man. Shame created a yeshiva. It was called the famous yeshiva of shame and his grandson, Aver. This was not a yeshiva for Jews per se. This was a yeshiva for the righteous descendants of Noah who wanted to learn divine wisdom and understanding. In fact, I believe uh, there, is a, there are Noahide institutions today that go by the name Yeshiva of Shame and Aver, which, you know, I don't, have a pro I don't have a problem per se because it is the legacy of Shame and Aver. Now, obviously, the curriculum of Yeshiva Shem Ve'ever was not the curriculum of Torah Vedas or Ner Yisrael or even Or Sameach. Uh, it was not a textual study of Gemara and Talmud. But, in, you know, again, we, only, we can only reconstruct it. But it was like a curriculum of godliness, a curriculum of spirituality, of Ruchnius. In fact, Kabbalah may have been a major part of it, some type of mystic, inspirational wisdom. So shame is still alive when Eliezer is there. And Eliezer interviewed shame and said to shame, can you describe was, what life was like during the flood? What was it like? And, and uh, shame ben Noach said, you don't want to know. We were busy from morning to night and into the night feeding all of the different animals. Some animals only eat by night and some animals only eat by day. And animals have special diets and Noah and us, we had to feed all of these animals. And one time my father was late with feeding the lion and the lion clawed off his arm. Noah lost an arm. So here's what Rav Dessler says. This is a Gemara. Rav Dessler explains it this way. Noah was a great man. Noah was a tzaddik. Noah was righteous. Noah was holy. I don't want to judge anybody else, but I'm pretty sure if I would have been around at the time of the flood, I wouldn't have been the one chosen to survive. So we got to be careful if we poo-poo Noah or denigrate Noah because he wasn't like Abraham. Keep in mind the extraordinary righteousness and holiness of this man. Unbelievable. But there was one defect in his character. The defect in the character was he didn't care enough about others. As the Zohar pointed out, he didn't pray for others. So now, Noah is going to be the progenitor of a new humanity. Briata Olam version 2.0 upgrade. But since we say in Tehillim, Olam Chesed Yibaneh, the world is founded on loving kindness. God cannot allow Noah to be the progenitor of a new world until Noah internalizes within his personality the Mida of which he is deficient love and care and concern for others. So for an entire year, day and night, what was Noah's responsibility? It wasn't learning and it wasn't davening and it wasn't meditating and it wasn't on fostering and deepening his connection with God. It was taking care of the animals compassion, care, commitment. And only after he did this, day after day, week after week, month after month, for 12 months, does God say, now and only now, you are ready to populate the earth and be the new Adam, the new founder of humanity. So we see, in effect, that the whole tachlit of the teva, the purpose of the ark, was not simply to give Noah and his family physical protection, but to 
internalize and in inculcate within their personalities the need for kindness, compassion, care and concern which had previously been lacking. Okay, this is the understanding of the Mabo. So now, let's go back to the original questions I started off with. And I think we can now have some good clarity as to the answers. Noach is a tzaddik. He is perfect in his generations. So let's start with the third question I asked. Why is it generations? Why is it plural? And the answer is because Noah lived in two different generations. And the transition between the two generations is the year of the flood. He lived in the pre-flood world, which was destroyed because of corruption. And he lived in a post-flood world, a new world of which he was the founder. So Doho Tav is appropriate because Noach lived through two generations with a transition of a year in the middle. Now, you'll recall that I had mentioned that the word Sadiq is primarily Bain Adam La Makom, between man and God. Tamim is Bain Adam L'Chavero interpersonal. But here is the thing. Before the flood, Noah was a tzaddik, but he was not a tamim. He didn't have that care and concern. So look at how the Pasuk is so exact. He was a tzaddik. In retrospect, looking back at Noah, he was both a tzaddik and a tamim. But those two qualities spanned two different generations. Before the flood, he was Sadiq, Ben Adam Lamakam, and only after the flood did he graduate to become Tamim. Sadiq Tamim Bidoro Sav. Sadiq before the Mabal, Tamim after the Mabal. And this gives us a different answer to Rashi's question because Rashi raised the question when Hashem tells Noach to go into the, uh, into the Teva Hashem says you are a tzaddik why doesn't Hashem say you're also a tamim so Rashi answered you'll remember that when you compliment a person to their face you only give them partial compliments but according to this interpretation you have a beautiful different answer. When God is talking to Noah before the flood, Noah is not a Tamim. He didn't pray for his generation. Noah is only a Tzaddik. Tamim is what he graduated into after the flood. It is the, the experience of the year on the Teva that taught him compassion and rachamim even for animals that he would then translate into human concerns. Hi, I just want to reassure people that although <laughs> this part of the shir I'm in a different room, it was not because of a siren, it was not because of a bomb, it's simply that there was a pre-scheduled shir in the conference room, so we had to move. So, Baruch Hashem, nobody should, uh, should panic or be worried about this. Uh, but the point uh, that I was making, just to reiterate, was that Noah started off life as a righteous, holy person, but he was not fully invested in caring about others. And that goes by the term tzaddik. So when Hashem speaks to him at the time of the flood, he calls him a tzaddik. But as a result of the care and compassion that he had to spend taking care of the animals, he developed empathy and compassion, and that elevated him to the level of tamim, so in retrospect, when God is describing the totality of Noah, he is described as a tzaddik tamim bidorotav across the two generations, starting off as a tzaddik, eventually became becoming a tamim. So the bottom line here is, on one level you see the importance 
of not just being involved with yourself. In fact, in many ways, you know, Avram Avinu was often called the first Jew. Now, that's actually a misleading name, and it's not even clear what it means to be the first Jew. I mean, after all, he was not given the Torah, which we normally define as, you know, what Jews are. But one of the ideas, it's not the only one, but one of the idea of being the first Jew was that a Jew cares about spreading godliness, not just within himself. Even before Noah, there were people who, I'm sorry, even before Avram, rather, there were people who worked on their relationship to God. And indeed, Shem and Aver even created a yeshiva. But once again, that was a yeshiva that you had to find your way to. You see from the notion of Avram, the notion of actively caring about others, not just waiting for them to come to you, but doing what you can for them. Obviously, without getting too political in terms of the situation we're facing, this is something that we do have to think about as Eretz Israel and the Jews of Eretz Israel are going through a crisis. What, what can we do to help the soldiers, to help the families? Uh, what type of comfort can we offer? What type of chesed can we do? Uh, visits, phone calls are very, very important things. And given the importance that we see in this parsha by the comparison that the Zohar makes between Noah and Avram, we see this imperative of caring about others. But to take the matter a little further, when you start thinking about this, it's not simply, oh, Noah was deficient and Avraham perfected Noah, or Noah himself got perfected. In many, many ways, Noah did what he had to do. Because here's the problem. Yes, if all things are equal, it's good to care about others. It's good to worry about others. It's good to have compassion. It's good to pray. But what about the fact that if you live in a world that is so degenerate, and so corrupt. If you get too involved in that world, it's going to drag you down. This is a great dilemma that I think Jews face all the time. I want to be a humanitarian. I want to care about others. I care about social justice. I care about morality. I care about fairness. But I get involved in a world whose values are so inconsistent with my values. So what do I do? Do I get involved and potentially endanger my own spiritual identity? Or do I have to separate myself just because of the instinct of self-preservation? So the point that we got to keep in mind is that Noah was not indifferent. If we say Noah didn't care enough about his generation, it's not that he didn't care. But he saw a world that morally was getting destroyed. And the only thing he could do was separate from it. And it could very well be that although he may not have been as great as Avram, who was able to confront that world and not get dragged down, in Noah's situation, that may have been the right decision. In other words, the point I'm making is the subtlety is that if we say Avram was greater than Noah, it's not that Noah was wrong and Avraham was right. Rather, Noah was right because he wasn't strong enough to withstand his environment, and Avraham was strong enough. So both of them were right. Because a person has to know their limitations. Okay, it's not a right versus wrong. It's if you're not strong enough, you need to take those steps. Rav Hutner puts it in a very, very vivid way. Rav Hutner puts it in a very vivid way. He says, in the Torah, there are two architectural structures that are considered to be structures of holiness. Of course, we have the Tower of Babel, which is a structure of rebellion against God. 
but within the structures that are holy and dedicated to God we have two binyanim we have the teva which is Noach Sark and we have the Mishkan which is the tabernacle the difference however between Noach's Ark and the tabernacle is Noach's Ark creates a protective wall so the destruction of the flood should not enter Noach's Ark is keep the flood waters out the Mishkan, which radiates the light of God into the world, is premised on the opposite assumption. Let the light of God radiate outwards. Noach, contain your holiness in a walled area so it shouldn't get destroyed by negativities. Mishkan, let your holiness radiate outwards. Says Rav Huttner, just as we find in the Torah itself that first there was a Noah who needed to protect himself from the environment. And then there was an Avraham who was able to go out and conquer and transform that environment. So just as First, there is a Noah, and then there's an Avraham. And just as first there is a Teva, an Ark, and then there is a Mishkan, that is a model for what we have to go through in our own lives. That a person needs a certain part of their life, ideally where they separate from the world. They distance themselves from decadence, from immorality. They focus on spirituality, they focus on purity. They focus on getting a perspective. We might call, for example, a person's yeshiva years, if they're able to go to yeshiva, as primarily putting themselves in an ark in which they're surrounded by the turbulent waters of the flood. But they can protect themselves by separating themselves from that environment. And that's absolutely necessary. But that's not the end purpose. You have to graduate from the ark, which shuts out the bad influences, to the mishkan, in which your holiness radiates outward to transform others to help others, to elevate others. And the difficult balance in life is that if you try to jump to the Mishkan too early, before you have properly developed your own morality, your own values, and your own Torah knowledge, it's likely that instead of your light radiating outwards, your light is going to be extinguished by the negative forces that come within. So you need the Ark before you get the Mishkan. On the other hand, when you stay in the Ark too long, you might become selfish, absorbed, callous, not caring about the world, not fulfilling the destiny and the mission of Avraham Avinu. So, you see the problem here, both in terms of our own lives and in terms of how we raise our children. There must be the Mishkan. I'm sorry, there must be the Teva. And there must be the Mishkan. In fact, in some ways, one might even look at Shabbos that way. During the week, we're so involved in interaction with the world. Shabbat we can withdraw from the world to reflect and recharge our spiritual values. And by becoming cognizant of my spiritual values, I can then re-engage with the world 
without fear of being corrupted and without fear of losing the perspectives that I need to have. Right, so Noah and Avram represent polarities in how we serve Hashem to combine and to integrate the balance with focusing on my internal development but then being able to give to others. You know, it's interesting, I'll just end, that um, um, the great Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the great, great uh, kind of inventor, so to speak, of the Muslim movement, the movement in Europe that focused on ethical character. When he was a young man, he was very attracted to a certain isolationist way of life in which there were tzaddikim in Lithuania who quite literally were hermits. They would go into the forest. They would meditate, pray, learn. They were not even with their families. Maybe on Shabbos they'd come home, kind of the opposite. The whole week they withdrew from the world. Shabbos they went back into the world. And Rabbi Saul Salantra was initially enormously attracted to a life like Lahavdil, like a monk, in which your whole life is focused on introspection, meditation, serving God. How wonderful that is. But eventually he came to the conclusion that a Jew does not have that luxury. A Jew cannot only focus on their spiritual development. A Jew has to be concerned for the rest of the world, the rest of his people for sure. And therefore he dedicated his life not to only focus on his spiritual development, but to focus on what he could do for others. And that's, uh, that's a struggle that great people have often had. The Chazenish, uh, who became a great, great, great Jewish religious leader in Eretz Israel, but for the first 50 years, 5-0, the first 50 years of his life, he focused primarily on learning and self-development. And when he was thinking over whether he should get more involved in Klal Yisrael. He wanted to ask the Chafetz Chaim for advice. And he shows up and the Chafetz Chaim is giving a drasha in general. And the Chafetz Chaim was talking about the obligation we have to reach out to other Jews and not just focus on ourselves. In other words, he's answering the Chazonish's question without the Chazonish even asking him. Many people reported that was often the case. The Chavitz Chaim somehow intuited what people were coming to ask him and he would talk about it. And the Chavitz Chaim said, you know, even I, Yisrael Meir, could have become a Talmud Chacham if I would only focus on myself. <laughs> he said, yeah, you know, maybe I'm not such a Talmud Chacham, the Chavitz Chaim said, because I didn't only focus on myself. And that was the green light. That was the message to the Chazanish. That he had to enter a new stage of his life. Of caring about others. And caring about Kuala Yisrael. And B'Ezra Sashem. I hope that we can both learn from the strength of Noah. To focus on our priorities. Not to be compromised. Not to be diluted. Not to be overwhelmed with a negative atmosphere. But at the same time, be Avram Avinus, whose light can radiate outwards to sanctify the glory of Hashem. So, good Shabbos, and again, thanks for listening.